<clears throat> okay, <clears throat> Hector Guimar, 1867-1942. He actually died in uh, New York. Uh, he immigrated, <clears throat> uh, he left France when the, the world, Second world, uh, world War started uh, together with his wife. And yes, he died in New York City. This was the man. Uh, and uh, I, I think one of one of the best uh, architects um, uh, of, of the modern movement, because he was a, a modern architect, although in some buildings, uh, some I think he was closer to what we might call tradition. Uh, but there were, you know, various shades of modernism. In some of, of his buildings, he was more radical. In others, a little bit less. But this is this is uh, the case with uh, with every every architect. So Hector Guimar, as you see, born on March 10th, 1867, and he died on the 20th of May, 1942. Was a French architect and designer and a preeminent figure of the Art Nouveau style. He achieved early fame with his design for Castel Beranger, uh, which you are going to see the first Art Nouveau apartment building in Paris, which was selected in a 1899 competition as one of the best new building facades in the city. He's best known for the glass and iron edicules or canopies with ornamental Art Nouveau curves, which he designed to cover the entrances of the first metro stations, of, of the subway stations of the Paris Metro. And they are, uh, you know, for all to see. Uh, any visitor to Paris, uh, I'm sure, notice them. Between 1890 and 1930, Guimard designed and built some 50 buildings, in addition to 141 subway entrances for Paris Metro, as well as numerous pieces of furniture and other decorative works. However, in the 1910s, Art Nouveau uh, went, went out uh, of fashion, and by the 1960s, most of his work had been demolished. What a tragedy. And only two of his original metro edicules were still in place. Very sad. Guimard's critical reputation revived in the 1960s, in part due to subsequent additions of his work by Museum of Modern Art, and art historians have noted the originality and importance of his architectural and decorative works. Now I ask myself, how come that between, uh, I don't know, when he left uh, France in 1960, uh, he, um, you know, he was rather forgotten and how come his works were demolished? Well, I think this was a consequence of the, of the uh, dogmatization of the critic of the of the modernist movement, because strangely, although modernism or modernity claimed uh, some kind of uh, running away from dogma, they built their own dogma. And it, if you didn't fit the requirements of each dogma, they would demolish you, or they would uh, uh, banish you into the forgotten lands of the uh, so-called. Uh, unimportant architects and so on. It is known that the revolutionaries, those who bring the a revolution in, shortly after the revolution uh, is uh, successful, they become themselves uh, rather conformist and dogmatic. And this happened also with the modernist movement. You know, if you didn't do white cubes, you were worthless, but it's not at all the case. And I'm very glad that after 60, Hector Guimard was reconsidered because he deserves to be reconsidered. Um, here are just, uh, you know, symbolically, I chose this image, uh, you know, with these two doors that he designed. I mean, look at the, you know, the, the complexity of, of, of the design. There are two simple doors, but they are not banal. They, 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 are, they are original. They are strikingly original. And, um, you know, what, do, what did we replace them with in the dogmatic mode of movement, really? With something better? I doubt it. This is what he said. I love architecture because in its essence, in its structure, in its function, and in all its manifestations, it contains within itself every one of the other arts without exception. It is probably true. 
I mean, I don't know. I mean, does it contain within itself also dance? Maybe, maybe even dance. But one thing is for sure, arts were part and parcel, part and parcel of, 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 of the very essence of architecture. It was always like this until recently when we got rid of the arts and we just build in the name of a, a very often very obsolete and, and actually damaging for the spirit and for the heart, so-called functionalism. I personally am tired of this very narrow, dry, soulless understanding of what architecture is in the name of a remote, and I hope gone, functionalism. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a reason for that functionalist to come into being. I understand after the eclecticism at the end of the 19th century, there was a reaction, but, but we live in a different world now. And I think we had just too many blank, blunt, white, dry walls and, 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 and white cubes and so on. And I, I think life deserves uh, complexity, uh, um, uh, representation in, in, in architecture that is more complex. I'm not sometimes there were great buildings built in the in the in the in the language using the language of the orthodox modernity. I agree, but for how long do we go like this? You know? For how long do we keep building um, the frigid white cubes? This was the man and uh, he was very, very successful, actually. And look at his uh, studio, you know. <laughs> I mean, um, he was a dreamer, if we could say so. I, of course, at that time, there were other studios, maybe very similar or similar to an extent. But the man, he loved art, obviously. There are sculptures, there are statuettes, there are flowers. Uh, he loved beauty. He loved nature. And, uh, you know, uh, what did we replace the aesthetics of such a studio with? This is my question. Some drawings by Hector Guimar. Uh, I always begin with some drawings. Um, yeah, well, you could say that, you know, he complicated himself, but, you know, art in, in, in its essence is in a way a form of complication because it's unnecessary. Nobody asks us to do art. And I totally agree with, uh, with John Ruskin. Well, I don't know if totally, but I, I, I agree in good measure, although it is a risky uh, agreement. I, I agree with him when he, you know, he said that the most beautiful things in life or in nature are those that are, that are less, uh, most useless. And he gave us an example, the tale of the peacock and the lily. And, I think at least to an extent he was right. You know, why did God or nature make the tail of the peacock like that? You know, or why did he make the lily so beautiful? You know, there are so many examples. Why are the, the, the wings of the butterfly so incredibly beautiful and the, at the same time so fragile? You know, what is beauty? Why, why is there beauty? I mean, what is the function of beauty? In some cases, maybe even the rationalists can find some reasons for um, certain kinds of beauty, but not always. It seems that God was capricious. He, it seems God loved beauty and uh, he manifested his beauty, his uh, love of beauty, sometimes through capricious, uh, you know, gestures, if I can uh, express myself in this way. Of course, the word God maybe is uh, uh, used, I mean, it is used uh, in reference to what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said when he was asked in an interview when he was over 85, when, when he was asked, do you believe in God? And, and Frank Lloyd Wright said, I do, but I spell it nature. Okay, so other drawings. We are going to see this house, this building uh, built and uh, look again, look, look, look at these uh, studies, you know, I think they are, they are mysterious, they are uh, sculptural, they are lyrical, they are complex. And uh, I wonder why so rarely we do something like this these days. Unfortunately, this drawing is not, it's too pale, it's difficult to see, but you are going to see this house. Uh, another, uh, 
tormented lyricism, if I can call it so. I wonder what, what did he feel? What did Hector Guimard feel when he, when he did these drawings? Um, he was obviously attracted by the, by the fluidities of nature. And uh, it, it is hard to, to say that they are not seductive. I think they are seductive. Now, he was not the only uh, architect who worked like this, of course. It's enough to remember Victor Horta in Belgium, another great uh, Art Nouveau uh, architect. And there are, of course, uh, reverberations of, of, of various shades of Art Nouveau or Jugendstil in Germany, in uh, Austria, in Vienna, we can see them. So. There was a certain type of sensibility at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which uh, I personally think it would be nice if we could uh, reconnect with that type of sensibility. Because it would bring some joy into the making of architecture. Because without these curves, without, I mean, you know, look at this drawing. It is an assertion of the labyrinthine character of, of, of nature and life alike, and maybe of our own soul. And we cannot say that it is not beautiful. We cannot say that it doesn't, in its intricacies, express something which is within ourselves. But in the name of rationalism and the right angle and no effort, often we neglected something like this. Although it's known that Ernest Neufert loved Antoni Gaudi. Hard to believe, but it is true. Uh, I don't know if I found pictures of this building, the Cafe Concert of Grand Neptune. No, I didn't. But this is the first building that I, I, I came across that he built and is the palace of uh, <laughs> the electrical energy at the Paris, uh, Paris Exposition Universelle, uh, Universelle de uh, Disneuf, uh, um, zero, zero, uh, so of 1900s. This was, can you believe it? This is the palace that he built in 1900s, in 1900 uh, at the Universal Exhibition in Paris for the electrical energy. Uh, I mean, if it was for some Hindu god or goddess or something, I would have understood. But for the electrical energy, obviously the, the electrical energy inspired people in, in very different ways than, than it would inspire us now. Uh, we cannot say that it was not an impressive building. It was, and it was demolished. But uh, funny in a way that, you know, we kill the gods, but we discover the electrical energy and, uh, you know, we... <laughs> We honored it, the god of the new, of, our, of the new discovery with um, uh, temple-like uh, architectures that would make, would have made even the, uh, the builders of the Bo of, of Bo Bo Borobudur, of the Bo Borobudur temple in Indonesia uh, envious. <laughs> yes, human beings love to, love to dream even when uh, maybe it's not, uh, you know, truly required to do so. Le Palais de l'Electricité, the Palace of Electricity. <laughs> it seems indeed that, uh, you know, at that time in 1900, people th thought that through electricity will achieve uh, eternal bliss. Did we? I mean, we are 121 years later. Did we really achieve bliss, eternal bliss through um, through electricity? Uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, yes, we have electrical bulbs, we plug in the vacuum cleaner, we have the refrigerator plugged in, but is our soul actually much happier? I'm not so sure, because if it was much happier, we would not need the myriad of uh, centers of uh, psychoanalytic treatment. As I saw, I saw a map of Manhattan with, uh, with um, locations of, of, of the therapy centers, you know, psych, 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 psychoanalytical uh, therapy. 
and they were like mushrooms under the, after the rain. I mean, thousands of them. I didn't count them, of course, but they covered the whole of Manhattan. So my question is, if Le Palais de l'Electricité, if electricity brought us immense happiness, why are we still anxious? Why do we still need Dr. Freud? Why do we still need uh, therapy centers? Therapy for what? Because we have electricity, it's obvious. Anyway, it was a good palace. I mean, look at that, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, look, look at those fountains, you know, countless fountains. It was impossible not to, not to, to, to subscribe to the dream that indeed through electricity, the paradise will be reached again. Although we, we had been uh, uh, banished from it, but, um, you know, we, we thought that we could re-enter it through our inventions. But did we? From 1900 to 1945, there were just 45 years between this Palais de l'Exposition de l'Electricité and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, less than half a century passed. How do you explain it? How do you explain that instead of achieving paradise, we achieved the Second World War and between this palace and the Second World War, there was the First World War. In fact, just four years passed since this euphoria and the First World War started. How do you explain it? It doesn't matter. We have functioning bulbs, glorious bulbs suspended from the ceilings of our rooms. If we are still unable to avoid war and to avoid hatred, you know, we could have all the electricity in the world, but if we are unable to make light within ourselves, they will still be useless, all those bulbs. Anyway, so this was demolished and we talk about, you know, today about uh, depleting the resources of the, of the earth and, uh, you know, uh, uh, excesses. Well, you know, if this building was built with effort and talent and money and time, and so on. Why did we destroy it? Why did we demolish it? And it's not the only one that was demolished, of course. Now, Hotel Rosé from in 1891. This is a little bit difficult to see. I mean, in this picture, it was, he was still at the beginning, you know, still a young architect, uh, hesitant to become too modern, so to speak. But um, um, I'm even not sure because there are two villas that uh, are very similar, look very similar, it, but it, it, it maybe it's not, a, a, you know, the biggest uh, mistake that uh, someone who makes a PowerPoint presentation could make because, uh, you know, the, the, the richness of information sometimes could make one dizzy and sometimes the identification of the pictures is not correct. Now, sepulture, what is sepulture? It's a grave. Uh, he designed several. It's something we don't do any longer. Louis Sullivan did, but not us. You know, uh, I didn't see any sepulture uh, designed by Zaha Hadid or Frank Gehry or M. Kolhas and so on. But at that time, there was still a, a seriousness vis-a-vis -vis death that I'm afraid we don't have any longer and that we don't believe any longer in honoring the dead with... Uh, you know, uh, an artistic uh, gesture of affection through architecture. He, he designed this and you'll see others a little more uh, creative or innovative in, as, as architectures. Now the villa I just said from 1893, uh, I, I think you saw a picture also with this one or they changed names, I, I don't know exactly why. This was identified as just said, but I also uh, included in the pre previous presentation, unless he built two very similar buildings, but I doubt they were so similar. Sepulture uh, Rushdi Bey Pasha, Pasha uh, from 1895. Um, what is, uh, you know, uh, a sepulture is domus eterna, meaning the, the eternal house for the one who, who died, who passed away, who went in the life beyond. Another one from 1895, uh, 
It is, may, most of them are in stone, of course, if not all of them, because stone uh, represents eternity. Well, in some uh, rural, rural uh, cemeteries, there are also, you know, gestures of affection for the one who died in wood. And I would say that they are not less noble. And uh, I think affection could also be manifested uh, metaphysically, not necessarily physically. After all, it's important the state of mind that is uh, addressing uh, the departure of someone in, 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 in the beyond. But often, uh, this is the habit, uh, you know, uh, for a sepulture, uh, stone is chosen. And as you can see it here um, uh, as well. Now, this is an important work by him, Le Castel Béranger uh, in Paris in the 16th arrondissement from 1895 to 1898. So he was approaching the, um, with great speed uh, the end of the 19th century. Uh, it, you know, it's called a, a castle, but uh, it's actually an urban building uh, integrated in the, in, the, in the front of buildings in, in Paris. I don't know very well why it is called the castle, but that's that's how it is called. And uh, yes, it has a certain richness that uh, most uh, urban blocks do not have, uh, but it's still, uh, you know, an apartment building essentially, and um, maybe with some so-called romantic features that would qualify it for what the word castle might mean. Castel, but the, the foyer, the main hall, the entrance hall is uh, its most uh, innovative uh, uh, feature. And you see already from the entrance door that, that the, the, the formal ideology, so to speak, of Art Nouveau is already manifest. And this is the, 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 the entrance hall, um, the foyer, uh, and it's ornated uh, all right uh, but I think on this ornamentation is not a deficiency. Uh, no, uh, sorry about the Alami word. This, 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 uh, this uh, company really bothers me with its uh, obnoxious, um, you know, uh, way in which it identifies itself. They destroy perfectly legitimate pictures in order to uh, claim auth so-called authorship. But they do have nice pictures. Too bad that they ruin them with that the name Alami all over. Um, so, yeah, we cannot afford to <laughs> to have such fires all over the world uh, because they are costly. But on the other hand, when we think of how many artists there are in this world that would love to show their craft and their talent, and they don't have the opportunity. Why? Because we don't associate ourselves with them. You know, the architect is very rarely thinks of collaborating with, with artists. And uh, it's a loss for everybody. The artist is dying of hunger, maybe, or uh, depressed and needs to go to one of those uh, therapy centers that I mentioned, despite the fact that he has electricity in his uh, cubicle. And uh, we make buildings that are not uh, very often very sensitive because because we refuse uh, refuse the collaboration with the artists. But this here, of course, at that time, there were still craftsmen able to carry uh, the, the work of the proposal of an architect like Hector Guimar. Those craftsmen are gone and they are hard to find. And, um, you know, unless we create a new school of crafts, uh, 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 yes, we could 3D print these days, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I have to think about it. If a 3D printed work has the same character as one that is done by the human hands, I, I don't want to, you know, to become in a way predictably, uh, you know, accusing the... No, I, I think it's nice we have 3D printers and I would gladly use them too. I'm just, I just don't know, actually. I, it would be nice to compare the same object done by the human hands and done by 3D printing and to compare them, to, to see if there is a difference. Maybe there is no difference, but I think it is because the one done by, by the human hands has slight 
slight so-called imperfections which might add a certain worth to it. I know that there are attempts now to, 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 to make technology uh, create slight imperfections as well, like in to mimic handwriting or whatever. I know this is almost like a perversion of its raison d'etre. You know, we make technology to things, make things perfect, but 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 then we turn against it and we 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 uh, instruct it to make things uh, mimic the imperfections of the human work. Anyway, this is an interesting work, and and and, and you know that you, you notice various details that uh, you wonder what are they? You know, well, they are the, the 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 tail of the peacock that John Ruskin talked about. He's still a little bit timid here, not in the foyer, but you'll see uh, later on uh, very interesting buildings by him. Already, they are anticipated with what is happening here. You know, again. The functionalist would ask, why? Why why do we do this? You know, but <laughs> we could equally ask uh, even more vehemently and, and, and a similar question about the tail of the peacock, not to speak about the, the, the wings of the butterfly. Uh, and so, you know, how do you feel? How does one feel when open such a door? as compared to a banal, you know, modernistic door that leads to a, to a parking lot uh, in, the sub, in, the, in the basement of the building. I don't know, I like to think, I like to think that when you open this door, you, it is suggested to you by the, by the architect, by the building to, to be a little more lyrically oriented and sensitive, maybe, although I'm sure there were crimes committed maybe in this very building because human beings cannot find peace of mind, doesn't matter the beauty of the building. But I still think that the beauty of the building um, uh, is necessary. Now, Villa Berth from 1896, uh, I'm not so sure that maybe this uh, tower which contains the staircase uh, was refurbished uh, in, in recent times. It seems to be a little out of, um, touch with what is happening behind. We'll see also the drawing that he did. Uh, and we'll also see the, the back facade, which is this one. Uh, so we see interventions in, the, in an Art Nouveau uh, key uh, here, usually the parapets, uh, you know, what is happening at the top certain so-called useless things, but these so-called useless things are important. Uh, and this was the original, <clears throat> the original drawing for this building. As you can see, uh, there, were, there is some materiality here that, that seems to be hidden today because of plaster or I don't know what. It would have been important, I think, if the building looked like in his drawing, because um, you know, sometimes excessive cleaning or, uh, you know, making smooth surfaces and so on takes away from the reality of the building, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, the plan, this was, uh, this is a recent drawing, unfortunately. You see, this is, this is how he drew these days, and this is how he drew, but well, there is a big difference. Because uh, here is, you know, just some lines and, uh, you know, it's very sterile. Yes, it's clear, it's true, it's very clear, but it's too clear, I would say. All the spirit of the building is gone. You know, here there are many little details that uh, have importance, that contribute to, to the musicality of the work. Anyway, uh, this is... Uh, drawing that uh, is again uh, recent or uh, after his uh, his drawings were became a building but the building even now has uh, interesting useless things here that that animate the facade and uh, i think these such things are important and that's why we talk about him actually because if he didn't have those so called useless things we wouldn't talk about Hector Guimard, but we'll arrive. I mean, look at this uh, entrance door into the estate. You know, it, it has character. You might like it, you might, you, you might not like it, but it's not an indifferent, uh, you know, uh, transition between uh, the street, the sidewalk, 
and uh, the garden. It seems it was a, a large estate. It is a large estate. And and actually, the, the work of man is, is, is relating in a way to the work of nature or God, to the trees, to the bushes, to, uh, you know, they're not so distant as if the work was, uh, uh, you know, bland work that tried to outsmart nature, so to speak, as if that is possible. Sepulture Nelly Chaumier, another grave, um, a stone grave, and it is a stone. But you see the, the sensitivity of the, uh, the architect is, uh, is uh, uh, taking forms that are, I mean, is taking form uh, in, in uh, sometimes in, in courageous ways. And, um, you know, here you, you see the, the sculptor Hector Guimard. Is here Paul's Nelly Chaumier. Uh, she died at uh, she died at uh, 50, 58. We often forget about death, but we will we will all go there. And uh, you know we are born in order to die. And I think uh, the noise of the present world uh, uh, is 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 trying to make us forget about uh, the fact that we are born unfortunately to die, and we will die doesn't matter, tall, short, thin, fat, uh, rich, poor, we all die one day. So one day, instead of Nelly Chaumier, we'll see maybe our own name, the Isi Repose, and so on. I don't want to sound morbid, but, but this is what life is. Maison Coyeux uh, is a very interesting house. It's one of his favorite works for me in Lille. This one is not in Paris but has a very provocative facade and you are going to see it. So Maison, Maison Coyeux, Coyeux. Uh, it's, 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 it's dramatic, the facade. Let me see all of it. Yeah, although, you know, he started with a building with a sloping roof, uh, you know, but, but the, look at the, at the asymmetries of the, of, of the facade. Although they are not totally capricious, there is some 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 reasoning uh, here because you know this column, which is eccentric, uh, you know, is also divides the facade in two parts: one smaller, one narrower, one wider. Uh, and here, this this arch, Gothic Gothicist arch, but because of its dimensions and its its both structure and ornament. And I think he achieves this in this house and other, uh, other houses. He achieves this uh, melange, this mixture, this meeting, this collaboration between structure and ornament. The structure becomes ornamental and the, the ornament becomes structural. I think it's a very interesting facade because, you know, it is a small house after all. But look, if you compare it with the one on the left and the one on the right, this one has drama, has a monumentality, has a playfulness. And, uh, you know, even the capriciousness of his choices are, is, 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 I think, enticing. I, I, I like it. And look at the interior, you know, it's, it's a creation, you know, he created something. Now you might not like it or you might like it, but it is a creation. by uh, Hector Guimar. Now, you know, we don't, I mean, this is not that he had a, a blank uh, and blunt uh, prism and he hanged, uh, you know, uh, the name of the, of the building uh, somewhere on the facade. Now, this is part of the, of the flesh of the wall of the building. And I wonder why we don't, don't do this. Tom Main does this in his, uh, in, in the Morphosis, uh, works that they do sometimes you know the, the the name of the of the company that resides in a certain building the letters of that name uh, he's playful with those letters so there is a, a, a way to narrate the uh, something about the owner uh, of, of, of the house just like Hector Guimard did uh, in this case but very often we, it doesn't even cross our mind to do this. But I think it's not a bad idea to do it. 
you know, because you give a name to, you give an identity to the building. You, you, yeah, you, you narrate something. Now, of course, as it is the custom these days, sooner or later, a new owner will come and, uh, but I still think it's nice to say something about the, if indeed we are functionalists, why not identify the building with the name of either the one who, you know, uh, commissioned us to do the work or, uh, you know, was, was to be the, the, uh, the inhabitant of that building and so on. Um, there are many, many uh, lyrical interventions here. These fluidities of Art Nouveau, which enliven the building both outside and inside. And everything relates to everything else. It's not that it is an applied decoration to a certain wall or a certain part of the building. No, it's the same architect with the same spirit that modeled the whole building in a certain way. Look at this, look at this, we call it a detail. Look at this one and look at this one. And they have the same function. But here it's an event. It's a it's a celebration of creativity, of talent, of craftsmanship. It says something. It says something that that you know the functionalist here on the left didn't say. So it's very interesting to compare this with this. And they have the same function. It's the edge of the building. But this edge of the building. Uh, says yes to life and to art, and this one doesn't. Uh, so what else can I say? Oh, uh, look here, again, you know, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a uh, sensitive and uh, emotional yes to life that uh, the dry functionalist doesn't think is necessary, but I think is necessary. And it can be done, of course, in many ways. Another villa from 1899, Villa Canivet. Uh, this one, for my taste, is a little bit uh, whimsical, not to call it differently. Uh, interestingly, that on this postcard, it was identified as being Villa Modern Style. <laughs> you know, I mean, we can only smile, of course, because the, 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 those people who named this villa as being a Villa Modern Style didn't know what uh, really modernity was up to and what was coming to. We would never call such a building being modern these days, no. But at that time, uh, I guess, in, it, interestingly, it is in Garche, where Le Corbusier built a building uh, like 25, uh, 30 years later. Uh, very different from this. Anyway, this is, uh, it was transformed. I understood it was disfigured. In fact, it was modernized. Now it is more modern, um, indeed. The same building, but so-called more modern. Now Villa La Bluette, Bluette deriving from blue, of course, Bluette, interesting name, 1899. Uh, look at this. Well, some of the blue is gone, but uh, here and there is still uh, uh, to be perceived. Uh, other colors those are still present or show up. But here he plays whimsically with the structure. And again, is the tension, the eternal tension between structure and ornament. You know, here it is structure, here it is ornament, but they, they dance a tango together, structure and ornament. They seem to be in love with each other, but they also sometimes have fights. Um, yeah, that's the, what can we say about romantic love? This is how it is. Sometimes uh, there is peace, sometimes there is war. Um, but you see the richness of matter, right? The stones, uh, various sizes, and then uh, the architect, look, look, look how he played with his windows here. And why not? You know, there is a moon on the sky. Sometimes we can see it, uh, and there is the sun during the day. Some, uh, sometimes we can see it. Here is something, I, you know, because of the shape, I'm thinking a little bit of the moon, not as much of the sun. But, but what I'm saying is, if in nature there are forms that are less clearly perceivable and, and you know, centralized and uh, monolithical, why shouldn't we have in architecture also parts, fragments 
that 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 celebrate the diversity of of, of, of nature and the diversity is existent in life in general also you know i mean look you know we here again it is a creation it is a you know a tension a dynamism a, uh, you know, it's a door. It could have been just an opening in a white wall, but it's much more than that. And, and because of it, I'm talking about it now. Or look at these doors, you know, or the functionalist would ask, why do them this way? Why not the other way? Well, of course, it, they can be done in many ways. But the capriciousness uh, or the capriciousness of the artistry of the architect felt a need to express itself, and it did express itself, and the color blue is for all to see, and La Bluette is still alive. And uh, <laughs> because this is what art does, it takes out of, of, of the banality of, of, uh, of uh, insignificance, insignificance uh, an object or a building, and uh, brings it to the attention of a passerby, or a viewer, or a critic, or someone enamored by uh, these beautiful capriciousnesses of the artist. And if we refer to God, or to nature, or to John Ruskin, yes, we admire the wings of the butterfly, and we admire the tail of the peacock, which are also capriciously beautiful. And look at this, he transformed it into an event, otherwise a completely banal corner. No, it is not banal any longer because the, the, the artistry of the architect uh, chose to, to manifest itself. And it did so. I mean, look, just this element here, you know, it could have had the same width, but it doesn't. Now you could say, why this slight curvature here and this slight curvature here, very, very slight, almost unnoticeable. Well, did we contemplate our body or the so many, uh, you know, uh, things in, in our body uh, that, that uh, you wonder uh, why, why was nature so uh, innovative and uh, again, rather capricious to, to make things in a certain way. It's difficult to answer. You cannot answer it. It's, it's an organic world. So he tried to do an organic building to an extent and so very different from the organic architecture of uh, Wright, for example. This was Hector Guimard. And not the building otherwise is not, you know, very alarmingly, uh, you know, uh, organic or uh, wild or no. It, but these things, he brought graphic arts ornaments and, uh, you know, whimsical uh, structural element to the building. And the building, uh, look at this door. It's the only door in the world like this, okay? What's wrong with this? Why should all doors be all the same? Why not have a door that is different from all the other doors in the world? And the, that one is another sepulture, Ernest Kaya. Uh, this one, uh, you see, he developed his language. He became Art Nouveau for Domus Eterna at well, uh, as well. So if you compare this one with this one, here you see a cre creative architect and a creative artist who tries to honor the life beyond in the same way as he does for the, for the life of here and now. That is creatively. Okay, Le Castelval from 1902-1903. Well, maybe the word castel or chateau or uh, castle is a little bit, uh, but maybe castel is a little bit different. I took the, the, the names of the buildings from the French uh, Wikipedia. Maybe it, it doesn't mean um, um, truly a castle or a chateau. It's something smaller, something more domestic. Uh, you see it here. This one is not so um, so um, you know 
outrageous, uh, outrageously creative or wild. Now it's rather subdued. Sometimes the client, uh, you know, didn't allow or didn't allow for uh, excessiveness in this field. But what can you do? Wherever he was able to, he showed he 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 was able to do wilder things, so to speak. Immeuble Jasset from 1903-1905. This is an apartment building uh, in, in Paris. He also built in Lille in France. Um, even here, you know, it's an apartment building. He remained in line with the cornice of the of the old building, and he is not is not uh, you know identifying itself in a, in an alarming way at all but there are here and there betrayals so to speak and these betrayals uh, mean uh, it was hector guimar who designed the building in a way the history of art and the history of architecture are the histories of betrayals because the architects we talk about are usually those who made um, works that uh, represented some forms of, of betrayals. Those who conform themselves are usually forgotten. And those who, 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 who employ various forms of betrayal, as I call it, uh, are the ones who somehow remain in history. So in a way, the histories of art and architecture are, 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 are and not just art and architecture. I mean, I could include here also music, uh, poetry, writing, uh, all the forms of art. Those who make it into the pages of history are usually the betrayers, the, those who betray, those who, uh, you know, step, stand out through various forms of uh, being different cultivating la différence like look at this uh, this uh, you know uh, it's a pole and there is a, the parapet of a chair of the stair and we see the stair but but this is not done with Ernest Neufert on the table this is done based on the imagination of the architect and and and, and that imagination had the last word and I'm glad he did Because, because it's also about the joy of the creator, of the, of the author, of the one who does this. If you don't have that joy, you know, I don't think you can be very happy as an architect. Now, of course, compromises are almost unavoidable at all levels. And I'm sure even uh, Hector Guimar had to compromise. An architect very rarely uh, is able to, to, to totally, uh, you know, uh, stay away from what we call a compromise. It's part of the job, but it depends how often and how seriously, you know, if you never manifest yourself who you are, if you never express yourself and you only make compromises and compromises and compromises, you'll never make it to the pages of history. Now, I'm not saying that that is a goal to make it to the pages of history. No, uh, no, that's not the goal. But the goal is to, to live creatively, to, to, to feel alive in what you do. That's the goal. Le Castel d'Orgeval from 1904. Uh, again, a castel. It's not really a chateau, it's a castel. I don't know in French. I have to study a little bit these words to, to differentiate between castel and, uh, and, um, and uh, chateau. This one is truly very whimsical and, uh, you know, and look what is going on here. But exactly this part, which seems to be crazy a little bit, is, is making the, the building uh, identifiable and interesting. Uh, as uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein said, for an idea which doesn't seem crazy at first, there is no hope. Well, yeah, it, it, it seems so somehow that, uh, I, I, I mean, you know, these things seem to be gratuitous, you know, they seem to be, uh, you know, disputable, this, they seem to be a little bit crazy, but all in all, the building, exactly because this peacock's tail, so to speak, stands out and becomes different from the other buildings. I like it. 
I like it, although I don't know. It is indeed whimsical and strange, but uh, I, I like it. Look, uh, what can we say? This is Hector Guimar. They, he brings something of the fairy tale in architecture, if I can say so. Just like uh, Hunter Wasser does or did in Vienna, and not, not only in Vienna. But uh, as opposed to Hunter Wasser, who was a painter, um, Hector Guimar was an architect, but was an architect with a great liking for the arts. You saw at the beginning, or you've heard, you saw those his words that he, he, under, he loved the architecture because it brought all the arts together. And he was convinced of that. Uh, so uh, anyway, I see here, maybe th there were some changes in time, the things were a bit changed, but all in all, the building was made kind of like this by, uh, by uh, the architect, Hector Guimar. There were problem, probably some 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 problems with uh, with uh, with uh, with a uh, chimney here. Or no, it is here, but I don't know. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it seems to be in the center of the, this part of the roof, and here is significantly on the right. I don't know. Um, stone. You know, stone, he didn't use, uh, well, this was 20 years, 25 years before Le Corbusier built Villa Savoie, which the tectonics of Villa Savoie are, uh, you know, not very uh, convincing, we have to confess. On, here, on the other hand, you know, you, you cannot question the, the tectonics of stone, it's impossible. Hotel Guimard from 1909, 1912, uh, when I don't, I, I, I pasted the picture, it, it was pasted this way and I decided to leave it like this. I know it's, 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 uh, it's uh, irrational, but I, I like it like this. Anyway, you are going to see the building as it is. It is like this. So um, you see again that at the top, he seems to get a little bit wild. And this happens often, you know, e even uh, Wolf Prix said that, uh, there are architects who are at their best, uh, you know, they are so-called basement architects. And he, he mentioned Raymond Abraham, and then uh, architects who are their best in, in the middle, so to speak, and he included uh, Stephen Hall. And then he said himself and Zaha Hadid are uh, roof people, and their architecture is roof architecture. Uh, uh, so I was talking about Wolf Briggs and uh, Zaha Hadid in the, in the perception or conception of Paul Briggs. Here, I would say that uh, Hector Guimar also has a problem, so to speak, with the roofs. At the roof, at the top of the building, he becomes, you know, exuberant, so to speak, or uh, transitorily enthusiastic, as um, Edward Darrell Stone would have said. Uh, it's a good, uh, it's a good building, you know, and again, uh, these eccentricities make the building special. Uh, I, I, without them, these or whatever, the, the parapets and, the, you know, here, so the metallic work and the few deviant uh, art or architecture gestures, because again, the, those who truly mean anything in the history of art or history of architecture, those with deviant tendencies. Uh, and um, so I would encourage a deviant architecture, sure. The more deviant, the better, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Because that deviance relates to the exuberance, to the, uh, to the uh, exaltation <clears throat> that Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, Walter Gropius referred to <clears throat> in the Bauhaus Manifesto when he said, both the artist and the craftsman are craftsmen. The only difference between the artist and the craftsman is that the artist is an exalted craftsman. So what we see here, there are small gestures or maybe not so small of exaltation. It is through these gestures that Hector Guimard qualifies as an artist or artiste in French. 
although, <clears throat> by the way of this, I like what uh, uh, Vincent van Gogh uh, said that he, he didn't feel he was an artist, but he was a painter. And I, I like the modesty of, of Vincent van Gogh, but he was very much an artist, maybe more than most of, of us or uh, them, or the artists, uh, very much so. But I understand because there, is, there are risks in perceiving yourself as an artist in other words, with uh, special, uh, you know, uh, attributes and uh, become narcissistically uh, involved with those attributes and so on. No, Vincent van Gogh was very modest. He said, I'm not an artist, I'm a painter, as if the painter is not an artist. But what he meant was that he earned the right to claim he was a painter because he earned the craft of being a painter. And he didn't want to emphasize, uh, uh, you know, something which was obvious, because if there was ever an artist, there was Vincent van Gogh. But on the other hand, he was a painter, not an artist. I, I don't know if I, uh, I, um, I explained well enough what I meant. On the other hand, Hector Guimard was an artist here. I mean, look at this table, look at the chairs, look at the furniture here. I don't know about this painting, the, the top. It wasn't by him, obviously. But um, anyway, we'll arrive at his, uh, at his furniture later. I like this sepia picture more, you know, uh, because I'm a nostalgic man and I, 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 I like uh, old photographs as this one it is. It's an integrated, uh, you know, all the cabinets are integrated into the wall and uh, it, it's, it's a total work of art or architecture. Architecture being as was once it was considered the queen of the arts. Now we see here other so-called artistic gestures, you know, uh, deviant uh, gestures, architectural gestures. But uh, they, they want to create a facade which is not dry and, and frozen in its immobility with, with a little bit of life or movement in it. If it is indeed architecture, frozen music, if it is that. Immeuble Tremois from 1909-1910. Look at this uh, the stair and, and, and you know the... <laughs> It is a creation. I think he was joyous when he created this. You know, it, it could have been very banal, but it's not banal. It's as if some kind of architectural vegetation entered the building. And uh, the architectural vegetation is important. Uh, the facade, uh, as much as we can see from it, uh, if we make abstraction of the tiring uh, Alami word, uh, is I don't know. It's not so different from other buildings in Paris, but but uh, still is. I look at the uh, at, at the doors or windows here, and uh, you know, small gestures of uh, betrayal, as I call them. Well, it's not really a betrayal, but it is ornamentation. It's a decorative work, and as such, the morose dogmatic modernist would say betrayal, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's a betrayal in the name of, uh, of artistic expression. So uh, look at this, uh, these two columns here. They, I'm sure the building would have been easily built in a different way, a simpler way. But you look at these fluidities and uh, I don't know, something is happening. It's catching your eye. Look at the windows here, there's a door here, and uh, you know, again, what could the artist do if not express himself, his feelings? He's supposed to do it, that's his job. If he doesn't do it or she doesn't do it, who will do it? The accountant? I doubt it. The lawyer? I doubt it. The general of the army? I doubt it. Is the artist who is supposed to do it. If, if the artist doesn't do it, who, who will do it? Who will paint the, the beautiful wings of the butterfly if the artist doesn't do it? Or the beautiful tail of the peacock? The artist is supposed to do it. And that's why we need the artist. Hotel Mezzara, 
so Paris 1910-1911. This one also is interesting. You know, it's it's a smaller building. It's not, but still it has movement. It has uh, that beneficial uh, capriciousness, as I call it. Is 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 the touch of the artist again. Um, and, uh, and and the doors, of course, uh, being playful and, and and joyously so. And look at these details here. Why why did he do them? <laughs> why he do them? Because they, he did them because he wanted us to smile. That's why he did them. He didn't want us to be you know morose and uh, dark and stiff. He wanted us to smile. And I do smile here. You don't see me, but I do smile. Um, and even here, you know, uh, look at this. Nobody will do something like this today unless uh, his name is Patrick Schumacher and at a very big scale, of course. But um, anyway. <laughs> look at this delicious little window here, you know. Uh, this one makes me smile too. <laughs> You know, it, it, it says I want to I want to participate as well in the chorus of the other elements. Allow me, please, to participate. Please, I'm just a small, insignificant door, but please let me participate. I want to be in the front facade. Would you please? And the architect architect said, Yes, I do. I allow you. And that's what we have. And we see the little window being joyous and making me again smile and happy. Uh, <laughs> look at it. Isn't it delicious? It's here. It, it, it accepted its uh, uh, willingness to, 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 to be observed and to, to uh, participate to the work uh, in, in a distinct way. A modest way, but distinct, nevertheless. The interior, uh, what can I say? It's a creation. Look at the ceiling. You know, it has structure, but an inventive, innovative structure. It has a nice skylight. Look at the parapets. They are also uh, creative, not uh, outrageously, uh, but uh, still distinctly. There are interesting things ha happening here. And uh, why? Because the architect was in a sensitive lyrical mode. That's why he understood that the architect is supposed to write poetry with uh, bricks, with stones, with uh, mortar, with um, concrete, with wood, with whatever. But he's supposed to make the building sing. And I think this one sings discreetly, it's true. But I think it sings. Uh, and look here, just this little corner, you know. It could have been done in many, many ways. He chose it this way because that was his way. And look at what is going on here. You know, I don't even know what is going on here, but uh, it is part of the building and it is uh, enticing and inciting. The lamps also descend from the ceiling in a certain way, not in an indifferent way. These are not lamps that, you know, you buy from Home Depot and you hang there yourself. No, this was done by the architect in a certain way and all lines converge towards these sources of electricity. The one that will bring us closer to eternal bliss. Villa Hemsey, St. Cloud, St. Cloud, uh, 1913. Here again, we see the roof architect enjoying himself at the most at the top of the building. Just like, uh, uh, you know, Ralph Erskine did uh, uh, in Sweden in a complex of some uh, habitations where he also <laughs> lost it, so to speak, at the top of the buildings. It's something nice when, when, when the architect understands that uh, although constrained by gravity also loves to fly a little bit and uh, at least metaphorically. And that's what we see here. <laughs> Otherwise, just imagine this building with a terrace jardin a la Le Corbusier, just a flat thing here. It would not have been the same building, uh, not at all. Uh, but on this one, the ivy loves to climb, 
just tell me how many buildings by Frank by by Le Corbusier were left enough by the ivy to climb on them. I personally don't know any. I love I love Le Corbusier, but why is it that the ivy is not tempted to well you could say is not allowed to serve because the pure work of, uh, of Le Corbusier is supposed to be left pure, untouched by the misery of ivy. <laughs> I don't think the ivy is so miserable at all. I actually think it's very uh, very nice and uh, also useful because it produces some oxygen which is badly needed. Uh, so, the coiffure of the building by Hector, Hector Guimard. Look at the flat Terrace Jardin here and look at the building by Hector Guimard. Which one is better? I think this one is better. And I actually even, I, I mean, you know, even Le Corbusier on top of his United Habitation in Marseille, uh, built uh, a strange uh, coiffure with uh, sculptural concrete forms and so on. So he, he, he didn't leave actually the, 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 the roof as flat as he, he might have been tended, uh, you know, theoretically. Uh, yes, this part identifies the building and this part connects with the, with the sky, with the, with the clouds, with, the, with our imagination in a way, with our dreams, with our aspirations. But of course, the, moder the morose modernist protests that uh, now we should not be carried away by emotionalism. No, not at all. A synagogue. He built a synagogue in 1913. Unfortunately, I only, I'm not sure about the picture inside, but outside this is the building, and I think it's a good building. Um, it, it has a... a even if I didn't know it was a religious building, I, I, I would have felt that there is something about it that is not really about, uh, um, you know, profane life somehow. And, it, you know, a difficult job because it was part of, a, you know, uh, the front of uh, the urban front uh, between two buildings but I think he did a good job. You know, a little bit uh, back from the from the sidewalk, and uh, it, it it says something about the otherness of religion, uh, and uh, it's not trying to compete. You know, with with the buildings left and right, it, quite the opposite is receding itself. But uh, but it, it does so in a certain way, and because of it, the the building I think has. Distinction. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. We'll, we'll finish, we'll end soon our presentation, and it's difficult for me to talk with a background noise. I would appreciate. Thank you. Uh, view from the interior, if indeed it is from this building, uh, I'm a little bit uh, confused. Uh, I, I, I really searched for pictures from the inside, and I, I found one that this one that was identified, but it, it seems to have a different spirit. Maybe it was refurbished or something. Um, I don't know. I'm not totally, totally sure that this is the interior of the building house facade we just saw. But it might be. It might be, but I, I'm not totally sure. Immeuble de Bureau, an office building from 1914, 1919. Uh, this one we have one or two more buildings to show and uh, the, um, he became so 1919 no 1919 yeah 1914 1919 he became more explicitly modernistic he became less uh, decorative or ornamental now maybe also the function of the building after all this was about a building destined to work for work not for play so maybe maybe he thought that if it was too ornamental, it might uh, distract people, the workers. But it's a good building, you know. It is nevertheless a good building. It's stripped of uh, some of the ornamentation that we saw earlier, but it, it, it's still a good building. And uh, yeah, still Hector Guimard. 
still a certain concern with the top of the building here in a more um, you know uh, measured way but but still you can tell that at the top he became again a, a roof architect a hotel a hotel particulier uh, also in paris 1921 1922 a smaller building but uh, even here you can you can see the, the the skill of the architect and again you see you know uh, through emphasis uh, of this architectural element that he is uh, allowing his um, uh, exaltation maybe the word is too strong in this case to manifest itself a little bit not uh, extravagantly But he and there still uh, allowing himself to, to, to be a, a, an artist, to be capricious and to play artistically. And now, because I had initially, I had a presentation which I'm going to see and you'll see a few works which I didn't, what you saw until now, I made uh, for this particular presentation. But I thought of not giving up on showing what I had previously uh, gather so I, I will go through more images with Gimar uh, some about some works that you didn't yet see but others that you already saw but with other pictures for example this one which is part of a, a, an entrance into a, the metro system the the subway system of Paris and we we learned that he he did many uh, subway uh, entrances uh, but uh, many were changed or demolished furniture will arrive at more furniture and he was quite quite a skillful uh, and prolific uh, furniture designer uh, this one we saw but not this particular picture we saw images of castel beranger but we'll see a few others it's more like an ad memoir of what we already saw uh, but with in, in in good measure with 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 pictures that you didn't yet see This fountain is nice, too bad <clears throat> the resolution of the picture is not uh, very satisfying and, and, and I apologize. Ah, it's a good thing that we have a larger picture with a better resolution of the fountain. Anything can become uh, a little event or not so little in architecture. If we pay attention to it, yes, anything. Like here, for example, you know, this parapet as it starts, it is eventful. The, the value of the ornament. The, the ornament does want to contribute uh, with a full heart to the anatomy of the building, to the well-being of the building. Whatever the, mo the morose modernist might say. This one we saw already, uh, one of his earliest works. And look here, you know, it's it's clearly a musical uh, fragment, uh, architectural fragment, very musical, I would say. And this one we saw. And now some, uh, uh, we'll see more of them, <clears throat> the, the subway. Uh, uh, some, I understood only two of them are, are still uh, alive. Uh, he did many, but we'll come back to it, to them. Hotel Mezzara, which we saw, but we you see a few other pictures with it. That window, which <laughs> received an homage, a particular homage from me today, and I don't know why I never did this before. I might not do it again, but today I like that little window.
We saw this building. We saw this picture, but not this one. Not this one. Not this one. Not this one. Hector Guimar. Hotel Guimar, we saw it, but we'll see a few other pictures. Just to say goodbye to him and happy birthday again. Castellon yet, you didn't see it yet, uh, but uh, and too bad the picture is not quite clear, but you still have a feeling and you, you, you can identify now rather easily a building by Hector Guimar because we saw a number of them today and we get a feeling about what he was up to, so to speak. Castel Henriette, he built quite a, a few of these castels, as they are called. Villa said you saw already a cottage, which you didn't see. Uh, uh, let's call it a cottage. It is a cottage, but uh, <laughs> it has a certain amplitude. Uh, as we learned, many of his buildings were demolished. Castel d'Orgeval, we saw it with a... <laughs> that part at the top that I commented on uh, to an extent. And now we arrive at the last architectural uh, uh, achievements of uh, Hector Guimar, uh, his uh, interventions for the subway system in, in Paris. Um, the, unfortunately, from what I read, only two of them are still alive, although it's hard for me to believe. Maybe some fragments or some parts, maybe the structures had been modified or you know reduced. I don't know if it demol demolished completely. It's hard for me to believe, but maybe because who knows, for you know, functional reasons, maybe they became insufficient, being rather narrow, and you know the population of Paris uh, amplified from uh, more than 100 years ago. But architecturally, they 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 are done very well. So you see. It says here, Guimard designed three types of entrances built in cast iron. They make heavy reference to the symbolism of plants. 141 entrances were constructed between 1900 and 1912, of which 86 still exist. So I don't know what we read at the beginning. Uh, but that, on the other hand, I don't know when this was written. Uh, I see 2011, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so he has three types, the open type, the cover type, and the enclosed type. And so he, if he designed 140 entrances, that's a lot. Maybe he was in competition with Otto Wagner in Vienna. Uh, and, um, you know, even if 86 of them, uh, I mean, if 86 still exist, it's not a little uh, at all, it's not, uh, uh, and, and they are remarkable. These are Hector Guimars, and no other architect designed such interests into the subway system. Only Hector Guimar. Uh, and yes, again, the ornament, the decoration, uh, you cannot remove it. And I think they look quite fine in the Parisian uh, uh, urban landscape. Furniture, and with this we end our presentation about uh, Hector Guimar. He designed a lot of furniture and built a lot of furniture. Here you'll see some pieces. A chair, 
the the aesthetical uh, style, so to speak, is not different from uh, his architecture, um, Art Nouveau through and through. Uh, they are exquisite pieces, and I'm sure they were not uh, easy to produce and uh, probably very expensive. Uh, but uh, what can we say? They were not really meant for IKEA. Many architects, as you know, design chairs. And I do think, and I said it before, and I say it again, it's quite a good exercise to design a chair. And I, I said it again, I said it in the past, and I say it again, including to myself, it's therapeutical to try to design a chair. And you just need a piece of paper and a pencil, or if you want to do it digitally, you can do it digitally now. This is quite elegant, no? Uh, <clears throat> the eyes of the desk. Why shouldn't a desk have also some eyes, two eyes? These are the, the, the ends of a, of a bench. Um, <laughs> they sell at Sotheby's or something, probably for a very large amount of money. Uh, what can we do? Uh, another desk. That's it. Happy birthday, Hector Guimar, and I thank you for uh, for participating today.